testing. As I was saying, I'm going to teach on something very important for your life tonight, boats. Hope you'll enjoy it. Okay. Seminar on the 29th. <clears throat> we'll go through the announcements here and then we'll get to the dock and load. Get on the boats. There's all of our teachings. Uh, there are uh, a couple hundred of them or something like that. YouTube.com slash House of Feeling AZ. All of our teachings are on there, including all my guest speakers. They're all on there. There's our good search uh, internet channel. You just put in our charity name. They pay us money when you look up stuff. Please get one of these miracle lists and send them out to somebody. They're lifesavers. I got two of them. I send them out every week. You know, very important. I do have one in Mongolian, but I didn't list it up there because I haven't had any requests for that. Weird. You'd think I'd have a bunch of them. Uh, any interest in getting in the deliverance ministry YouTubers? There they are, 18 classes. You go through those classes, bang, you're ready to go. What's church like 2,000 years ago? It's the same now. Find out how that works. 2,000 years later, it's all the same. Tithely, you can donate, download that on your phone if you want to and send us a donation if you're in the mood. Don't forget about the Carter's uh, prayer service right here, 11 o'clock, fourth Saturday of the month. And then please stay for the teaching in the small sanctuary, fourth Saturday of the month at noon. Those are our donations on the door there. If you want to donate to the ministry, thank you. You can donate on the website, PayPal. That's where most of our donations come in at. And, boy, I had some wild radio shows coming up this week. One of them on Tucker Carlson. You hear about that one? Nobody? He had a severe case of satanic sleep paralysis. A demon attacked him in bed at night cut his body up. Really interesting. Did a radio show on that one. Uh, did another radio show on uh, uh, people who lost their jobs during COVID and got fired. You know anybody that got fired during COVID? Well, anyway, um, in Minnesota, some lady working for Blue Cross Blue Shield, a uh, Michigan, excuse me, Michigan, Blue Cross Blue Shield sued them for firing her because she wanted a religious exemption. During COVID, I was sending those out every week. I was shipping them out to every people were contacting me. I need a religious exemption. Well, if you got fired, hey, she got $12 million. The court, the jury found that her religious rights were violated because she got the ax because she wanted a religious exemption to take this thing. Oh, it's kind of an interesting radio show. I'm on every morning, Monday through Friday. Yes, sir. Saturday and Sunday, too. There's my podcast every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, for my shut-ins and my friends. Twitch.tv. These are ambush teams that are being set up all over the country. Two or three people are setting up a group to pick off the sick people in their church. YouTubers, please do that. I'll help you with it. I'll even do a Zoom with you. Don't forget about Brother Rick on Wednesday nights. Stephanie's there. This thing is, this service is crazy. I mean, it is fantastic. There was like 50-something people going through deliverance all at once last Wednesday. I mean, it was freaked out. amazing number of people going through deliverance all at once. Six o'clock, Wednesday night. You can send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you all the information. There are the three books I wrote, Satan, Healing, and Mental Illness in the bookstore. Lori's in there. And Tuesday nights, uh, Julie, thank God, is teaching the 
the root cause and cure of mental illness. That's the book I wrote. Tuesday night, 6.30. Fabulous. Monday nights is, you know, the Zoom for our ladies. That thing is incredibly good. And here's Saturday night's Zoom. Okay? Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Mountain and Arizona time. The Carter, Michael Carter has a Zoom. And please don't forget about our children's deliverance service. I advertise this on the radio and every, every one of my shows. This thing's really special. December 7th at 10 o'clock, small sanctuary. And our worship service, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after here in the main sanctuary. That thing's going great. So I'm very happy right now. I'll be even happier when I help you with boats. I know a lot of you are interested in boats. You're dying to hear about them. As a counselor, I can read body language and facial expressions, and I see the anticipation on your face right now. Now, there's some boats in the Bible, and you know exactly uh, uh, who they are, remember? Here they are. Here's, here's your biggest one. Well, oh, that one was huge. Noah's Ark, about half the size of the Titanic. This thing's big, huge. And I'll tell you what, that... That thing must have stunk to high heaven. Can you imagine the animal poop in that boat? God bless Noah. He must have been a tremendous man of God. <laughs> I had a Noah experience years ago. I sure did. I went to see my relatives in Illinois near Springfield. And one of my relatives... These are, these are cousins. They don't have anything to do with me. But I, years ago, I, I go visit them once in a while. And this guy's a pig farmer. And um, he took me out to his farm. And I had never seen. And I didn't know anything about pig farming. He said, oh, yeah, they're in this giant. So we went out there. There's this giant barn. It was aluminum. And uh, he said... Uh, you, want, you might want to brace yourself. I said, what are you talking about? I said, well, the smell, you know, can be difficult. I said, oh, come on. What are you talking? You're talking to me, right? Yeah. Let's go in. Boom. I mean, to tell you, I almost projectiled, vomited. It was the worst smell I've ever smelled in my life. By far, pig poop. And I mean, rows of it. So, God bless Noah. I got a special place in my heart for Noah. He was a great man of God. Boy, that place stunk. Here it is. Moses had a little boat. Remember that? Oh, it was cute, wasn't it? Thank God for that. A little boat like that led to saving millions of Jews. Wow. Wow. You know, as the Bible says, don't despise small beginnings. Uh, all right, we got a lot of backsliders here tonight. Um, <clears throat> Jonah had a boat. He got tossed off of the boat. Remember that? Paul's missionary journey, shipwreck. Paul's prison boat, remember that one? Peter's fishing boats. Oh, we got a lot of good stuff here tonight. But... We need to get to the Word of God and see what he says about it. Luke chapter 5. It came to pass as the people pressed upon Jesus to hear the word, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. There it is right there. And Jesus lived over here near Bethsaida. Remember that? In Capernaum. And he lived near the Sea of Galilee because he did what? Traveled all the time. And back then, an Uber was a boat. But they had Uber back then. They had boats. So he traveled everywhere. There's Gadara, where, it, where the uh, maniac of Gadara got delivered, right? There's Mary Magdalene here, where she got delivered. So anyway, he hit all these cities. And uh, this lake at Gennesaret was huge. And it was a great fishing portal. And Peter and... James and John and Andrew 
they were all brothers, two pairs of brothers, and they were in the fishing business together. And they had money, and uh, they were well-off, you know, upper-middle-class citizens. And uh, Jesus uh, in, approaches the uh, lake, and he sees two ships sitting there, fishing ships. The fishermen were washing and cleaning their nets. He entered one of the ships, and, which was Simon's. And he, told, he asked him and prayed him that he would thrust out a little bit from the land. Why was he doing that? Megaphone, you know, water carries your voice, right? So he pushes out from the land. Second, he wouldn't, he wouldn't get trampled if he was in a boat. So he sat there and taught the people. Notice here, notice something interesting here. Jesus said he did not come to be served, but to serve. He asked him if he could use his boat. <laughs> God asked Peter if he could use his boat. Okay, well, teaching us what? Yeah. yeah, you're supposed to be a humble person, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> okay. He sat and taught the people in the boat. Now, when he left speaking, he said to Simon, listen, launch out into the deep and let, let down your nets for a draw. Now, here he's teaching us something deeply spiritual. You know, if you give something to God, you got to understand something. You cannot outgive God. That's not possible. Now, there's two ways to give something to God. You can give it selfishly, looking for a pat on the back, or you can give it out of a good heart, generously. And if you give it the latter way, guess what happens? Something good. <laughs> Launch out over here, and Peter says, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> when you showed up here before you were teaching, we had already been out all night. They, they worked graveyard shift. And we didn't catch anything. We normally do, but we didn't catch anything. Oh, what a great spiritual lesson. You know something? Bad things come into your life for a reason, and they're always for something good. The Holy Ghost shut down the fishing business for a reason. What was that reason? Well, let's find out. Nevertheless, at your rhema word, I will let down the net. Oh, another spiritual truth. Boom. Hits me right in the face. God tells you to do something that makes no sense. You don't understand it. But by faith, you do it anyway. It's not like a marriage. If God tells you to do something and you don't understand it, you can't figure it out, it seems weird, you adopt an attitude of, I don't care. I'm just going to obey. Why is that? People who obey get blessings. People who rebel, they get nothing. Rebellious people always come up on the short end of the stick, emotionally, physically, mentally, financially. They always end up empty. Hey, if you say so, I'll do it. Anybody ever give you a rhema word? Ever heard that? What is a rhema word? Well, it's uh, the logos is the complete concept of the Word of God, and the rhema word is a part of it, the smaller part, part of it. So the rhema, logos would be a subject you're studying, and the rhema word may be a little piece of it. So he gives him a rhema word and says, hey, let down your nets, even though it seems stupid and it doesn't make any sense. And when they did, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, so many fish that their nets broke. And then they started yelling to their partners in the other ship to come over and help them. And they couldn't because there was so many fish, it filled both boats to the point they were sinking 
Why is that? God's showing you a simple spiritual truth. Hey, if you'll listen and obey, even if you don't understand, God's going to fill your boat. This is a teaching on boats. I see the boatish look on your face. Both ships loaded with fish. Why do you do that? Well, this is the purpose, one of the purposes of miracles. Miracles are designed to affect your conscience. When you see a miracle, it's supposed to touch you in here. It's supposed to affect your conscience. Well, it worked. Peter collapsed. Why? He knew he was in the presence of God Almighty. They were astonished, at, and everybody was, at the agra, the hall of fish. Agra is where we get our English word agriculture. Thank you. They took in a hall they had never seen before. And that's typical for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> that's, that runs in his family. He likes to outdo everybody. And it's so easy for him to do it. Outdoing everybody collectively is like him falling off a log. It's that easy. Boom. I'll give you something you've never seen before. I'll do it if you'll obey. I'll do it if you do what I say, even if you don't understand why I said it. Hmm. James and John, the sons, sons of Zebedee, they were partners with uh, Simon and Andrew. Jesus said, fear not. From now on, you will catch men. Now we're getting an idea why all these fish filled these two boats. If these four guys were going to leave their families, their families were going to need to be supported. And so all these fish were going to take care of their family. See, God knows your needs before you ask. He knows what you need before you, before you ask him. Peter and James, they had no idea why all these fish loaded the boats. Well, there was a plan and a purpose, and that's what God has for your life. He's thought ahead for you. He looked down the road you aren't able to see. And he already made a provision for your needs. <laughs> Fear not. From now on, You'll be fishing for men. When they brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. All the fish went to family business. Their wives and kids all taken care of. They had no idea that's what it was for. But God always looks ahead in your life. He always looks down the road. And he sees, oh, a month from now you're going to need that. Six months from now, you're going to need that. Tomorrow, you're going to need that. He's looking down the road for you. Will he supply all your needs? Yeah, if you listen to a rhema word and you obey, even if you don't understand. Had they not done that, there would have been no fish. There would have been no divine teaching because he wouldn't have gotten the boat, and he wouldn't have been out in the boat teaching. If you learn to obey when you don't understand, God will do remarkable things with your life. Problem with uh, modern-day Christians is they want to know everything. They always analyze things. Oh, they're great at analyzing stuff. Let me think about that. Let me think, what, what do I need to analyze? No. There was no analyzing. Can I borrow your boat? Yeah, go ahead. 
why don't you dump your nets over there? Okay, that doesn't make any sense. That seems stupid. I just worked 12 hours, eight hours, whatever it was, all night long. We're all out here, and there's no fish. We're screwed. But nevertheless, I got a rhema word. I'll go with it without questioning it. You see the spiritual point of this. And they forsook all and followed him. And let's try another boat. You want to? Okay. Luke chapter 8. It came to pass on a certain day, he went into a ship with his disciples. And he said, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And so they launched and left. And when he entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. Uh, on this boat teaching, what I did was I took the, the Gospels for them and I kind of blended the, them to get more detail in the stories. You know, if you read this story in, in Mark, you're not done yet. If the same story is shared in Luke or John. Or, you got to read all of them and you piece the details together. That's what I like to do. So I get more information out of it. Because none of the gospel writers cover everything. Right? So I said this, this one gave that, this one gave that. You put it together, get a pretty good picture of what's going on. It's really interesting. The Bible's fascinating if you take a little time to read it. A lot of good material in there. The disciples followed him into the ship. And as they sailed... He fell asleep. <clears throat> okay. And there came down a storm of whim. A lilaps is a windstorm. Like, uh, like a tornado, like a hurricane. Something above ground that's, you know, blowing like crazy. Okay. We don't have any of those things here in Arizona, but they do around the country. And this windstorm hit the lake. And... The boat started to fill up with water, and they were in jeopardy. While God is sleeping, what's the spiritual truth? It's so easy to see. It's unbelievable. You have a destiny with jeopardy. Your blessings come in the form of problems. Wow. God is sleeping while you're having problems. Wow, that's not a very good God. I, guess, I think I'll go with Buddha next time. No, there's a reason he does that. And in this story, we've also found out that the root cause of this windstorm, a lilops, was a tsunami. Seismos is a tsunami at the bottom of the sea. That's what was causing the waves to go crazy. And the waves were then driving the wind. Yeah. So this story was really interesting. When you put them together, you see that this is a tsunami. And he's sleeping. You know, okay. You see the truth of it, don't you? You're going to get a windstorm. Then you're going to get a tsunami. Not all the time, but sometimes it's going to happen. And it's going to appear like God abandoned you. And these guys felt exactly what I just said. They felt abandoned. And they came to him and they woke him up. They said, listen, we're going to die. And so, Jesus woke up and he rebukes the wind and the raging of the water. He stopped a tsunami. That's what I call a miracle. Epitomao is a Greek word he, that's used in the text to rebuke demons. So like Job, Satan was manipulating the weather to kill him. He wanted him to drown. 
He gets up and rebukes the whole thing. And guess what happens? Boom, there's a calm. And then he says to you, you're going to get a windstorm in your life and you're going to get a tsunami later in your life. And what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Chill. You know. Take it easy. It's hard for Christians to take things easy. They get emotional. They get upset. If you'll learn to chill, your miracle's right around the corner. It's on its way. See, before the wind hit and before the tsunami hit, God already knew about it. Anybody following this? I'm sure you are. You're going to have some tough times, folks. I'm sorry. You know, I know this is supposed to be Joel Osteen, but I'm sorry. Things are going to go bad for you. There's a reason for it. There's a plan for you. Uh -huh. Well, I got a tsunami. You wouldn't believe my brother or my sister or my wife, my husband. You know, these people are crazy. Yeah, they're walking tsunamis. God saw them walking around your house, and he's got a plan for you. If you'll just chill. If you'll just obey, even though you don't understand. When's God going to fix my husband? When's he going to fix her? My mother. She runs her mouth like a busted chainsaw. Hey, if you'll chill. It's a, it's a windstorm, right? When that person opens their mouth, it seems like a windstorm. They talk nonstop. James stand it. There's a miracle on the way. If you will obey, even though you don't understand. What manner of person is this? Yeah, they were like shocked. What wipes out faith faster than anything? Fear. I've, done, I've gone over 200 times over the years. Fear is the devil's secret weapon to beat Christians. That's how he whips them. Whips them like dogs. Why is it so valuable to him? Well, he knows if you, you're afraid of something, your faith is gone. And he knows without faith, God is not going to send you your blessing. He can block them. He has legal rights to do it. That's why it's so hard to get addicts healed. Why? They have chronic fears. Fears about their future. Their health. Fear is Satan's Bull whip. He straps you to the whipping post and he beats you with fear. Hey, why were you so afraid? Why were you afraid? Translation. Let me tell you what Jesus was really thinking. Why don't you trust me? They didn't trust him. And that was personal to him. Well, you're not listening. When you have fear, it means you don't trust him. And he takes it personal. And then he asks you about it. You know, that kind of hurt. Why were you afraid? Why? 
He answered in the same question, didn't he? Oh, my goodness. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh. I was sleeping down here. I was exhausted. I just fed 5,000, 10,000 people, whatever it was. That's exhausting. Sure it is. I'm taking a nap. And the devil comes for me. And he's going to kill all of us. And you don't trust me. You think I'm going to drown just like you. You don't believe in me. So he takes it personal, and then he asks you about it. He doesn't scold you. You should have did this, and you should. No, he asks you a question. And asking somebody a question can be as scary as them yelling at you. In a way, they're yelling at you without yelling at you. They just ask you a question. Oh, I don't believe. What manner of man is this? Is this translation? I don't still don't believe. They should have already known what manner of man he was. Both boats were full of fish. You should already know what manner of man he is. You got saved from God only knows what in your life. The horror you've been saved from? Half of you people should be dead already. Right. You should never have to ask that question. But when you get scared, faith goes. And the blessings disappear. Let's go to another boat. He commands the winds and the, and the water, and they obey him. Who is this guy? You should already know who he is. You're a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. All right, now let's go back to our map here. That's where he was earlier. Now, across the lake, feeding 5,000, the maniac of Gadara, all that stuff. Remember that? Luke 8, they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Yeah, it is. It's here, Galilee. And when Jesus perceived that they would take him by force, why did they want to do that? Well, <laughs> we just had an election. Nobody remember that? Well, last week we had this election. And two of the most insane human beings you've ever seen in your life were running for president of the United States. Unbelievable. I'm not getting into that, but I did get it in on the radio. Oh, that was a nasty show. But if you can feed all of us and meet all of our, all of our needs, okay, we're going to go with you, not Caesar. Oh, no. No, he wouldn't have any of that. He had the bolt. So he left and went to do what he did often, which was at lone time with God which I hope you're doing. You have your devotional period every day? Anybody? When his disciples came, the disciples went down to the sea. John 6. And Jesus told them to get into the ship and go on over. And he sent them away. He stayed there for prayer. Okay? You know, and that's one of the dangers of being in the ministry it's really risky. It's caught me several times. You get so busy ministering for the Lord, 
that your uh, devotional time kind of starts to sag. And then you're, you keep ministering, but you're getting sicker. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> no, probably doesn't. You're ministering like crazy, but you're getting sick as a dog. Well, Jesus wouldn't have any of that, so he always carved out time to get away from the 12 nincompoops and the rest of the people. <clears throat> See, what you've got to do is get away from these people that are dragging you down. You need some alone time with God. Crazy family members, nutty spouses, goofy parents. They're all sick. But you got to love them. But you don't have to be with them all the time. You need some alone time. Come on. I feel like I'm at the Mormon church. Is, uh, does anybody understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> so he sent them away. Sometimes you got to send people away. You know, you don't give them a good custom. Get the H out of it. No, I said, just can you, I need some alone time. You don't have to be hurtful about it. Just scram. Because some people want to hang on to you like a barnacle. And that's fine for a while, but... Then you got to peel those suckers off of there. I don't want to get into that. That's too, too anointed. They send them away, which is what you should be doing. And he went up to a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, he was there all alone praying. Matthew 14. I'm flipping around here on the same stories. And they entered a ship. They went over to the sea toward Capernaum on our map. The map's not up there right now, but they were down here at Gadara, feeding the 5,000. Now they're going back up to where he lived in Capernaum. And it's dark now, and Jesus no-showed. See? He no-showed again. Oh, what's he trying to tell me? Let me think about it. Ah, I got it. You're going to have periods of time where it's in your life where it seems like you've been abandoned by God. Every Christian, 100% of them, has to go through it. Times you're going to feel like he left. He never showed up. Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? And then while Jesus is praying, he sees, Edu physically sees, must have been a vision or something. He saw them trying to toil and row in the sea because the wind had picked up. And the ship was jacked up. And it was about the fourth watch. And Jesus came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. What does that mean? He was going so fast, he almost missed the boat. Why? He saw them toiling. The other group, they were in jeopardy. God saw you toiling. He saw you in jeopardy, and he's on his way, running to you. If you will just listen and obey without understanding everything, because God never tells you everything. In fact, he rarely does. Well, it was the fourth watch. Hmm, pretty late there. He's going so fast to help you, he would have passed them by. And this wind it was blowing like crazy. And they had rowed, out, rowed away from, the, from Gadara about 25 or 30 furlongs, which was a stadion, which was a generalized uh, estimate of measuring. And it came from the Colosseum in Rome. So... They said, well, stadium is where we get our English word stadium. And they said, well, a uh, furlong would be size of the stadium. And then this furlough, and then you add the length of the stadium. So anyway, the point is it was, you know, around four miles or so. They're out at sea there. They saw Jesus walking on the sea. He finally slows down. And then he starts walking toward the ship. And once again, oh, he gets a little sting in his heart. He took it personal again. They're scared. You 
You can see why Christians don't get their blessings and their anointing and their giftings, can't you? It's real easy. The Bible gave you, here's God's word and here's all these promises and you're afraid. Look at them all. I don't believe that. I'm scared. And God asks you a question when, he, when something hurts him. He says, you know, why are you scared? Now, there are two watches, right? Now, the Hebrews had a watch, which was broken up into three sections. So, uh, hypothetically, this was the first watch, six in the morning till 10, from 10 till 2, from 2 in the afternoon to 6. And then there's a night watch and there's a day watch, right? Well, this is what's in the text because the New Testament was written in Greek, and so they were on Roman watches. And so um, here's where the watch, here's six in the morning, nine in the morning, noon, three in the afternoon. That's a day watch, right? Then you, the night watch. So here it was sometime here, the fourth watch. So it was at night, early in the morning, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, sea, they were terrasso, emotionally agitated, and they said, that's not Jesus, that's a phantasma, a phantom, a water spirit. You got all the promises, there they are, they're all right there in the Bible, and you're scared. And God's kind of hurt over it and I guess you like Buddha instead of me right because here's your promises and you're scared I'm afraid two types of people can't live together fear and faith one of them's got to go. There's Jesus out there. You know, it kind of looks like him, but he can't be walking on the water. What kind of a person is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. What's he doing? No, that's a demon. Well, if you you think Christ is a demon, that kind of hurts him. Doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> believable. Then they're so scared, their crowds are yelling. I mean, that's a person that's really scared. You've seen those things on TikTok or Instagram when somebody, boo, scares somebody. You ever seen those? They're supposed to be funny, but actually people are really scared. Well, that's what they are. They're petrified. They're yelling. That's what they do on TikTok. Somebody scares them. Ah! Well, this is TikTok. It's Instagram. They're yelling. Why? They, you don't trust me. Oh, not again. Yeah, again. Well, wait a minute, I, the boats were full of fish. The tsunami stopped. And you don't know who I am. Kind of hurt. Doesn't it? Do you know anybody that you love who's who has uh, lots of insecurities? Anybody? Two people, three, four, five, six, seven, all right, eight. They drive you nuts, don't they? They sure do. Here's why. You tell them you love them. You tell them again. Then you tell them again. 
they don't receive it. And then pretty soon the person gets kind of tired of saying it. Then their insecurities get worse because now they don't hear it all the time. Well, I don't say it anymore because you don't receive it. So I'm getting tired of saying it when you don't believe me. This is too deep for this section. This is the essence of faith and miracles. What, what, a, what we're learning today is the essence of it. Do you trust me? Am I a demon? Jesus thinking? You think I'm a demon? That's what they said. They were yelling it. It's a phantom. It's a spirit. He heard him. He's not deaf. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, hey. Once again, man, can, if you get a rainbow word from God, if you can learn to chill, the miracles are right there. He was asleep in the boat during a tsunami. They were afraid because they didn't trust him. They were all going to drown. Bill comes in, you can't pay. Oh my God. You start yelling, crowds out. No! He heard you. And you say, oh, I got hurt. You don't trust me to handle that <laughs> bill? Jehovah can't pay a bill? What? You got to be kidding me. <clears throat> Be not afraid. Why? Demons drive your blessings into the pits of hell, whipping you with fear. That's where all your blessings went. That's where your ministry went. That's where your anointing went. To the pits of hell, whipped by fear. You lost everything. Because you were afraid. And you were afraid because you didn't trust him. What are you doing here today, Mike? What's happening here? I'm summarizing the entire Christian world on the planet Earth. I should be on Oprah. Hey, it's me. Don't be afraid. Oh, wow. Fear can cause you to th see things that aren't there and see things that are there in another form. In our business, my business in counseling, they call them hallucinations. Fear can cause you physical problems. Fear can cause you mental problems. Worst of all, it causes you to lose your basket of miracles that God had sent you before you got in trouble. They were already sent. Well, Peter then suddenly gets a burst of faith, man. He goes, you know something? This is a great opportunity for me to show off in front of these other disciples. I always do that at home. I'm going to do it here. Lord, can I come out and walk on the water? It was like, a, to him, it was like a ride. Sure. 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 What's going on right now? Can't you see it? They're in the middle of a storm. They're not sitting on the shore quietly on a Saturday afternoon when it's 80 degrees up, no wind blowing. They're in the middle of a storm. And Peter wants to come out and walk and get out of the boat. The other 11 disciples are staring at him like he's out of his mind. 
they hunkering down in the boat. Nobody makes a move. They're watching this idiot. And Jesus doesn't say, he says one word. Let's go. Come on out. In the middle of a storm. What? What's the purpose of this? There must be some method to his madness here. There is, certainly is. Peter got out of the boat and he starts walking and he starts heading to the Lord. That's what you did when you first got saved. Remember that? You got filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember that? Oh, that was so, that was a great day. And you were walking toward the Lord. Oop, and then you drifted off over here. Something scared you. Scared. I'm scared. And when Peter looked down and saw the wind, of course, you can't see wind, but a hallucination would allow you to see things that are not there. You can see things you can't normally see. Fear causes it. Fear causes you to develop, to develop paranoia. Fear causes you to develop a mental illness where you're afraid of things that can't really hurt you. Fear will cause you to develop a mental illness called a phobia where you manufacture fears over something, someone, some incident in your mind. He's looking at Jesus. Now he's looking at the wind. You can't see the wind, but fear allows you to see disaster before it hits. Fear allows you to see disasters when there aren't any disasters. <gasps> Boo. What happens to him? Of course, what, that's what happens to you. That's what happened to you. You start to sink. Why? You had a rhema word. You, got a, you were afraid. Translation, I don't trust you. None of King David's brothers went out to face Goliath. Why? Fear. Little pre-King David comes out. He doesn't have any fear. He says to King Saul, listen. Jehovah, the Hebrew God, delivered me from the lions and the bears. I'm not afraid like everybody else. Who is King David? A nothing and a nobody. He was a kid. But people who believe God, who are not afraid, can do anything. If the devil can't get you afraid, then he has to lose. He has no choice. He's beaten. King came over there. Hey, I need some stones. Give me five of those. There you go. Good, perfect. What do you need five stones for? Well, Goliath's got four brothers. I'm going to take out all five of them. One stone apiece. All of his brothers sat back there, quaking in their build, boots, filling their depends. All of them had Parkinson's. <laughs> Fear causes your body to react in ways you can't conceive nor believe. Fear causes you to pick up illnesses that aren't real. A kid had no fear. That was the one Jehovah went to. He can't use Christians who are afraid. He has to pass them by. Lord, so and so, deliver me from what? Death. I'm drowning. I'm going to drown. This is what he's thinking. 
took his eyes off the Lord. His mind took over, fueled by fear. I'm going to die. I'm dead. They were in the boat. Lord, wake up. We're all going to die. See, fear causes you to say stupid things that aren't real. Fear causes you to get divorced. Fear causes you to go broke. Fear, Satan's number one enemy in a whipping Christian. Why? He's a master psychiatrist. He's the best in the business. He knows what the human soul does. He knows what emotions are. He knows how to trigger emotions in people. And fear emotions are his masterpiece. He manipulates the person like a puppet when they're scared. Lord, save me. What are you doing? I'm saving you. He reaches over, pulls him out of the drink, looks over at the other disciples. Are you watching this? Everything he did in the Gospels, all the way through it, every one of them, was a teaching seminar. Everything was teaching. That's what I wanted to do years ago. I told the Lord when I first got turned my life over to God. I said, hey, you know, this Bible thing is fascinating. You know, I'd like to be able to teach something someday. So interesting. I want to learn. I'll put in the study time. And I'm not afraid. But I had a lot of things going for me. I mean, killing it, face, it's deadly. But what was the question? Oh, gosh, I wish God would stop asking me questions. Those questions really bother me. What really makes me mad, he never yells at me. I wish he would. At least I know where he stands. Where is your faith? Translation, why don't you trust me? Why are you doubting? Gestadzo, why do you vacillate between this and that? This and that. That's a doubt. Gestadzo, doubting. You have little faith. Why are you doubting? Why are you vacillating? Back and forth. Between what? Fear and faith. They can't live in the same house. One of them's got to go. Peter started out in faith, right? I mean, that took faith to climb out of that boat and step on the water. Are you kidding me? That took a lot of faith. Particularly when you got your 11 of your friends are staring at you with their eyes bugging out. Like, what are you doing, you idiot? None of them got out. Listen, listen to me carefully. If you're going to exercise your faith, you are going to be one of one. Nobody's going to support you. Nobody's going to care whether you do it or not. You have to decide. To do it on your own without other people patting you on the fanny, kissing you, encouraging you. No! Sometimes you're going to be alone. It's going to happen. It happens to all of us. Where's your faith? Why are you doubting? You're vacillating back and forth. Then they brought him into the ship. And then, unbelievable. 
This is one of the biggest miracles in the Bible. This is Red Sea stuff. Teleportation. How does that work? I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in teleportation, but how did that teleportation happen? Well, they were worshiping him. Now they're finally getting on board. Okay? The, the boat filled with fishes didn't do it. The tsunami didn't work. The storm nah, didn't make it. This one, now they're starting to climb on board. See what God's doing to you? He's giving you jeopardy. He's giving you challenges. He's, gonna, he's leaving there for a minute, so you think he left you. He's leaving you deliberately because you're thinking, See, he abandoned me? What happened? What going on? See that? And then he comes through and gives you another chance to learn. He's taking these guys through a learning curve. Why? The day of Pentecost is coming. I need to save Brother Mike at the Deliverance Center 2,000 years from now. He's training these guys on the boat to save you. Divine providence. God can't explain it. They were worshiping and the boat suddenly teleports to the dock. How does that work? Well, it works, I don't know, but it has happened before. Here in Luke 24, on the Emmaus Road, remember that? He's sitting there having lunch with him and poof, he's gone. Where'd he go? Well, he teleported somewhere. <clears throat> the Jews were in hiding, the, the disciples were in hiding after the resurrection. And then what happened? Boom. He suddenly he's standing there. Strange. What was he doing? Once again, they got scared. They thought he was a demon before. That hurt his feelings. Now he's standing there right in the middle of them. Now they're scared. Faith and fear cannot live together. There's no way. One of them's got to go. He says, uh, listen, calm yourselves down. Chill it out. You got any fish around here? Yeah. They hand him a fish sandwich. He takes a bite of it. See that? Demons don't eat fish sandwiches. Look at me. Here, touch me. Feel my, see my flesh here? My fingers? Flesh fingers, like a human. See that? Grab that. What's he trying to do there? Talk to them like they're idiots? No, he's trying to beat Satan's greatest weapon. Fear. They were scared. And the first thing he said, peace to you. There, he's always saying, 18 times in the New Testament, fear not. Peace to you, was all he said after the resurrection. Said it three times. Peace to you, peace, peace, peace. Fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? Fear destroys faith. Faith wipes out your blessings. You get to stay a drunk. You get to stay an alcoholic. You get to stay chock full of demons. You get to stay single the rest of your life and die an old maid. You get to do all the things the devil wants you to do because you are afraid. I got to be helping somebody. YouTubers, am I helping you? Peace to you, he said. Why? They were scared. What is that teleportation? I don't really know, but I think it has something to do with there's some kind of wall between the spirit world and the natural world. And somehow, I don't know how this works, some people transfer through that wall. How does that work? I'm not sure. I've never done it, but 
it's a real thing. There's, I don't know what they call it, portals or veils or whatever they call this thing. But, you know, theoretically, if I, if it, if I had the anointing, I could step out of this world and just step into the spirit world. You could transition from one to the other. It happens to everyone when they die. Right. They transition out of here. They teleport somewhere else. The body stays here. Is this making sense? <clears throat> Check this out. Uh, this Greek word here, harpazo, means to snatch, right? Like that. Give me that. Snatch. Well, Philip got snatched or teleported to Astia. He baptizes this guy, and he gives him some instruction, tells him what to do, and suddenly, pew, through the, through the spirit world, how does that work? I don't know, but he goes through there and poof, falls back out in another town. Don't send me an email and ask me if I'm still on LSD. I'm not. There's a spirit world that you transition into that is some kind of veil that is just as real as things on this side. Okay? So Philip went through that portal or whatever that was and ended up at Asias. And then it says he went around preaching to all the other cities. Strange. But he was snatched, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Now it says, the same Greek word, watch this, in Thessalonians, talking about the rapture, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a, one, a shout, two, a voice of an archangel, three, a trumpet. The dead in Christ shall rise first. My interpretation of that is the ones that have already died. And then we which are alive at the time of the rapture shall be harpazo, same Greek word, snatched. I'll be talking to you one day if I'm around then. Poof, I'm gone. I go right through the portal to whatever that is, wherever that is. See that? Same principle. Philip temporarily went through it. And then when he died, he went through it again. Right? He left his body here on this earth, then he transferred through the portal into the spirit world. Rapture. Well, who else has done that? Well, John Lake mentioned it in one of his books. Remember that? Watchman Nee mentioned it. Remember that? He gets out of prison. He just gets out of his, walks out of his cell. He's walking down the hallway to the front entrance and nobody sees him. The sucker walks right out of the prison. Nobody saw him. How's that work? I don't know, but there's a, there's a wall or a portal or something here that I can't see that if you go through it, no one sees you. In the same way, I'm on this side of the portal. I can't see demons or angels listening to my wonderful teaching on boats. See, I know they're all here wanting to learn. They're all eager. I can't see them, but they can see me. And there he goes, walked right out. the no, Not one person saw him. No, walked right by the guards. Nobody saw him. I threw this in. I thought it'd be interesting. You know, I guess I shouldn't have done it, but let's go to the next subject. Uh, back to boats. Thank you. Boats. Jesus sitting on the shore. Now, this is latest in his ministry at the end of it. Remember? And before the ascension, the ascension ends the ministry. The day of Pentecost starts the church. So he's standing there and he's yelling at the guys in the boat. Remember? 
And the morning came and Jesus stood on the shore and the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. <laughs> that should have landed. You know, in addition to fear, anxiety, depression, loneliness can cause you not to see the blessings of God in your life. It's like they disappear. I get two to three calls a week from people who have clinical depression. They say the same thing to me. I, I feel like dying. I don't, I don't think anybody cares about me. I don't, I don't, where's God? See, they can't see anything. There's this cloud of depression. Ruins their vision. Vision. Gone. Depression. Causes you not to see someone's love for you. How many calls have I had over the years? I don't know. I'm, Mike, I'm suicidal. And the first thing I say to him, you're a very loved person. That's the first thing out of my mouth. I had one this week. Depression causes you not to see things God wants you to see. Pleasures. They looking right at him. Who's that? They got better though. They didn't think he was a demon. <clears throat> Jesus said, children, have you any meat? Nope, we don't have anything. No, they're yelling from the boat. What's going on here? Another setup. This is a spiritual adventure. More training, right? Jesus said, hey, throw your nets on the right side of the ship, not the left side. The right side. Do the right thing. Getting a born again Christian to do the right thing is like pulling teeth out of yaks. They dig in like Alabama ticks. They don't want to listen. Why? They don't trust him. Throw it on the right side. Do the right thing, even if you don't understand it. See? You got a rhema word. Just go ahead and do it, even though you don't understand everything about it. Just go ahead and do it. Just do the, just do the right thing. Remember that movie? Do the right thing. Hey, do the right thing. Throw it on the right side of the ship. Suddenly what? Of course. Too many nets, fish. As soon as the miracle happened, it reminded him of the other fishing miracle at the beginning of his ministry. Hey, can I borrow your boat? We'll ship it out there. Now, throw your nets over there. We fished all night. We don't get, but because you said it, we'll do it. That was at the beginning. This is the end. Boats in the beginning and boats at the end. You folks don't appreciate the level of intelligence you're facing right now. I make Elon Musk look, a, look like he's got autism. The boat starts at the beginning. Get on. It'll carry you all the way to the end. Hey. All of a sudden, the miracle drops the cloud. It's him. Not, it's not a demon. It's Jesus. You see how he lovingly kept working with them over all this time, three or four years? These boat rides were at different stretches. He closes it out with another boat deal. And Peter... 
Peter took off his tunic and his undergarment. That's what they said. If you were only in your undergarment, they called it being naked. He dives into the sea, probably to help load the fish in the nets. And the other disciples came in a little ship. They weren't very far from land. They were about 200 cubits. What's a cubit? How many cubits do you have? Well, depends on how tall you are, but you take a cubit here, and then how many cubits are you? How, how big is a boat? How big is a cubit? Yeah. About 100, 100 yards or so, something like that. They're dragging the net with the fishes. Now, catch this one. As soon as they came to land, they saw a fire of coal. Training, teaching, hey, hey, you do your job, and I'll do my job. Oh, wow. God doesn't want you doing his job. He wants you to do your job. He'll do his job. What is his job doing? Miraculously providing your needs. They get to shore, and they can't believe it. What are you doing here? The fire's already going. The Meals already cooked. God's got your meal waiting for you. You just keep working on the fish and the nets. You just come to shore to get it. Praise God. Christianity is not a cakewalk where you, they stop the music and number two, I'm on two, I get a cake. No. You got to use your faith and beat the fear out of yourself. Your meal is already there. You're out in the boat and you knew nothing about it. God's provision was already set up for you on shore. The fish and the bread were there. Brother Mike, this is an interesting Bible study. But you know what pisses me off? What's that? This is not happening to me. I, I know it's not. I just told you why. When you're afraid, it's all gone. When you're afraid, you're telling God, I don't trust you. You see that? I've had a couple dozen marriage counseling cases and several of them were the wife who had developed paranoia over the husband cheating on her. And whenever I have a case like that, I always do my own investigation. I'm good at that. I investigate people. I try to find out if there's any actual evidence that he's cheating on her. I ask the wife. Then I go through, I write it down, right in the session. How do you know he's cheating on you? I don't say it accusatorily, I say it informationally. How do you know that's happening? I got my pen in my hand. I got my tablet right there. Yeah? These are the weapons of a counselor. Tablet and a pen. See that? It's dangerous, particularly if it gets subpoenaed. I'm not going to go into that. I said, what's the evidence of it? And most of the time, not all, trust me. I knew what it was. Fear causes you to feel things, sense things, and believe things that aren't real. We call it paranoia. One guy came in and he said, I think I'm going to get fired. 
I pulled out my weapons. <laughs> Tablet. Bam. Hey. How do you know you're going to get fired? I wait with bated breath to write. Somebody else had gotten hired and got a promotion. Okay, and he hadn't gotten one. The other guy got hired after him. So the demons told him, hey, you're not as valuable an employee as that other guy. You're going to get the ax. Tablet down, pen down, nothing on there. What is it? Fear. Fear. Fear causes your body to jack itself up. Fear causes ticks. You ever seen somebody with a tick? Thank you. I, that's Academy Award material. I know that. <laughs> you ever heard that? Seen that? I, I think. What's going on? The body overloaded with fear, usually in childhood, now is reacting to the fear like an ulcer reacts to fear. Tick, tick, tick. Abnormal sweating, weird body smells. Body odors, what's it cost? Fear causes your body to jack itself up. Why is it doing that? Oh, ye of little faith. Why are you scared? There's no reason to be scared. Hey, you can't see the meal waiting for you. Everything's on shore right here waiting for you. The fire's up, the fish is done, the bread's there. It's all waiting for you. There's no reason to be afraid. You know what else fear causes? Hemorrhoids. Ever have a good batch of hemorrhoids? Don't raise your hand. Ulcers. Fistulous. Tumors. Can be caused by fear. I told you this anointed story before, but I had a hemorrhoid one time in my life, and this thing was bad. Oh, it was tough. I couldn't sit anymore. And that's tough when you got a desk job. I said, man, I got to go to go to the doctor. So at that time, I had Humana insurance. Yeah, I mean, this thing was, it was big. And uh, so I waddled into the doctor's office. Hey, I got a, a hemorrhoid. This doctor comes out, young guy, looked like something out of Men in Black. You ever seen that movie? <clears throat> the guy scared me more than the hemorrhoid. <laughs> and he says, oh, it's, he goes, I'm so glad to see you. You're glad to see, now I want to bolt. Okay, but I can't, you know, I can't run fast and get out of there. I'll just lay down here and take your pants off. Oh, great, this is getting better by the minute. This was like 30 years ago this happened to me, 35 years ago or something. He goes, it's, it's so nice to have somebody to come in to actually treat, he says. He's talking to me while I'm laying there, with pants off. He goes, usually I have to talk to people all day. I get so tired of it. I thought, well, that click. wait a minute, that kind of clicks. Uh, yeah, I talk to people all day long in my profession more than he does. Yeah, and I get, it, does, it gets exhausting. He goes over to this little tray area here, pulls out a drawer, 
pulls this thing out, takes this paper off, this needle, pulls it out, and it's a needle like, what are you, are you kidding me? Like Dracula or something. This thing is big. It looked like it was like two inches, two and a half inches, huge. It's on a syringe. He pulls the syringe back. There's nothing in the syringe. He sticks this needle in my hemorrhoid. <gasps> I'm holding on to the bench for dear life. He pumps a bunch of air into my hemorrhoid and it explodes. Boom! I mean, I thought I was going to get some medication or something. Can I have something to... Walgreens? Where's the pills? Oh, no. We're going to get a nice needle in the fanny, you idiot. Plus, you're going to pay for this. He grabs a tissue or a towel or something about it, mops my fanny up. Then he goes, want to see it? Boom! And it's this, bio, looks like a giant blood clot. See that? He got a big grin on his face. Huh? See that? I mean, like he hit the lottery. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I got to get out of here. Never had another hemorrhoid again. 30 years later, I am hemorrhoid free. That's right. That's right. See, when you walk in faith, you don't get hemorrhoids. Friend, what I'm trying to say to you is everything looks like poop right now, but your dinner, your buffet, God has it prepared for you. It's on the shore just out of your vision. It's close. You just can't see it. It's right there. Yeah. These are all true stories, or most of them. Jesus said, bring, bring the fish you caught. What? You... Miracles don't fall off of trees. You do your part. God does his part. You have to keep doing your part. Whatever it is, whatever you're called to do, whatever you're supposed to do, just do the right thing. And God spreads out the dinner for you when you don't even know it's there. God allows you to face tough times for a reason. John 21, Peter went up, drew the net to land, full of 153 fishes. Strange that they counted them. That's really weird. There were so many of them but, did you notice in the first boat, the nets broke? Did you happen to notice after they were trained and they saw Jesus, the nets held up? When they didn't see him as a demon, the nets hold. No matter what the devil does to you or what he brings to you, your net is going to hold. It might break in the beginning. That's okay. You're in training now. But a day will come when your nets don't break. And guess what he's saying to you? Come and die. Remember that song? Anybody used to sing, sing worship songs out of hymnals? Anybody ever heard of a hymnal? No? Okay, well, anyway, years ago in churches, they used to have what they called hymnals, and it was filled with a bunch of songs. And most of them were old songs, like 1900s, 1950s, stuff like that. Well, that was one of them, Come and Dine, the Master Calleth, Come and Dine. You can dine with nobody? Okay, well... Anyway, there was a song like that, and that's where they got it, out of this verse, 21-12. The disciples asked him, 
None of them said, who are you? Why? Now they knew. Now they knew. Why? Because you've got to go through this. It's not easy. It's not easy. You used to think it was a demon. Now you know it's the Lord. But that's way down here. Not in the beginning. Everybody, every one of us, has to go through this training period to be used by God. Every person. Nobody gets out of it. Wigglesworth trained for 30 years. Can you imagine that? 30 years. Until he got his massive worldwide ministry. 30 years. Will you have to train 30 years? I'm not saying that. Everybody's different. Yours, yours will be shorter probably. But the point simply is, you got to get into that boat to get to this boat. They knew it was the Lord in the end. He took the bread and he gave them the fish. All right, let's close with this. Do any of you lack wisdom? Don't raise your hand. You can ask God directly. You don't need me or a priest or anything like that. You can go right into the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, you go right in. Am I right? Yes. You go right in on your own. You don't need me. You don't need anybody. God gives liberally. Well, he sure does. That boat was so full of fish it was sinking. So was that one. Those nets were breaking. Now the boat's full of fish. But because you endured, you listened, you repented, you learned, you were patient. Now your nets don't break anymore. No matter what the devil throws at you, your nets hold up. You don't relapse. You don't get drunk again. You don't go back to porn. None of it. Your nets held. Now you got him. God gives liberally. Liberally. He doesn't say negative things to you because you asked for it. He wants you to ask for it. It shall be given, period. That's what it says. It shall be given. Rhema, word. But, oh gosh, doggone it. I hate it when there's a but. Particularly when I have a hemorrhoid. That's a rough one. But, whenever there's a but in the text, that's a Greek, in the Greek it's a conjunction. Obviously, it's like English. It ties this part of the verse to that part. Conjunction. But. What is but? Allah. Well, I thought that was a false god. No, in Greek, Allah is but. This goes with that. But. Ooh. Let him ask him. Faith without wavering. Diacrino, going from this to that to this to that to this to that. Is it this? Is it that? Is it this? Is it that? Is this? What? What causes people to this to that to this to that to the fear? Why? I'm apprehensive about picking the right one. I'm scared. Doubt causes fear. Fear causes doubt. This one, that, this, that. Let me analyze this some more. I got to get it right because if I don't, oh my God, I'm going to fail. I've got fear of failure. I gotta get this all figured out. Now, if you'll just do what God told you, even if you don't understand it, your miracle is sitting on the shore, a buffet 
prepared for you coals of fire. Amen. Coals representing the Holy Ghost, the one and only. Is it this? Is it that? Is it that? If you're doing that, don't bother to ask. There's a but in the verse. Don't bother to ask. You're not getting any wisdom. But if you ask in faith, you get it. For he that wavers is like a wave in the sea. That's, my God, that's a water spirit. That, that isn't Christ. Why? Can I come out with you? The waves, he starts sinking. He that wave, what, 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 is like a wave in the sea. Like you're not in the boat, you're in the sea. Ow. What happens when you get in the sea during a storm? You drowned. Driven with wind, tossed around. What does that mean? You can't get it right. You thought it was this. You thought it was that. You've analyzed it and you figured it out. And it's not working. I hear that constantly. Over and over. Hey, Brother Mike, these things have improved in my life. Boop, 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 boop. But that's still there and that's still there. I don't know when I'm going to get rid of it. When am I going to get rid of it? What is that? That's the sound of them being whipped by the devil. Oh, you got that done, did you? Whack. You're not going to get that. Why? I am afraid. I don't trust him. I'm wavering like a wave in the sea. I'm sick. And I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. You're going to repent of it. <laughs> Uh, who needs wisdom here tonight? Just raise your hand there. Oh, look at that. What a big crowd. Big crowd. That's encouraging. All right, let's pray.